All right, everyone, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. We're continuing our move to the Scriptures as we look at one of the first letters that Paul wrote in all of his epistles. Chapter 3, we're in verse 10. <clears throat> Starting in verse 10, we'll keep on reading. Uh, for as many are as of the works of the law, I'm sorry, are many, for as many are as are of works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Curses everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we, might, or that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Part of the issue that the Galatian church was having was, remember, we've been saying that the, the churches, this is a collection of churches Paul is talking to, and they are the audience, the receiving audience of these letters are, Paul is talking to are believers. You may remember back to verse 1 where he says, you foolish Galatians. This is language he's talking about to who has bewitched you before whose eyes Christ was publicly portrayed. You've heard the testimonies. This is what we said last week. This, you've heard the testimonies so much so that, you're, that Christ it was almost publicly portrayed before your eyes is what he's saying. So he's talking to believers and he's trying to correct them for adopting foolish things, trying to abide by law following in a, in a manner of, of growing them in their faith. Is trying to re refresh their memories and bring them back to repent from law keeping as a way of sanctifying them and growing them as believers. I heard a song the other day <clears throat> as I was in a gas station, which I would I don't even know who wrote it, but it's the lyrics were something about I'm broken and it's beautiful. I'm sure you guys probably know who I'm talking about. I have no idea who wrote that song, who sings it. It was someone, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it's the, the idea that the culture today is already they're in, a, a, they're in a form of self-glorification. And we get this kind of self-worship, this narcissism that was born out of the age of, you could say, self-esteem in the 80s and the 90s, or maybe even the late 70s, that's probably started. The scripture paints the opposite picture. Yes, we are broken. But rather than painting us as beautiful works of broken art and then held up to our own glory to say, look what we can do even though we're broken and breeds a narcissistic kind of arrogance that promotes further self-congratulation. Scripture paints us as needing to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves. Usually and almost always, that's the last thing that we want to do. We don't want to be humble. We don't want to give up our desires. Submission is not something that's usually found in the person, average person's vocabulary. We need to understand the law, yes. But we need to have a better understanding of grace and mercy and how it's applied to us. Because misunderstanding this leads to the daily problems that many have of assurance of faith. And that's kind of what's lingering around at the root of this issue. It's important to understand that many people who profess faith don't have an issue, an issue necessarily with being grounded in whether or not they believe the work of Christ. And therefore, believing God. But the issue is of the heart. Are they grounded in the, their assurance that they are of the faith? 
Am I really someone who believes? Is my believing true? Am I really of the faith? You could say it simply, have I truly believed? Very often they turn to works of the law to find such a grounding for their assurance. They do so apart from faith, as, they, as we talked about last week. Faith is given by God. As that is the, the context of our, of our discussion today, we need to understand that the believer can no more put uh, their faith in, in Christ than the unbeliever can profess faith in Christ either without the infusion of faith by God. The believer professes true faith in Christ by impartation of such faith by God to have truly saving faith. The unbeliever, conversely, cannot profess true faith because of the lack of faith infused to him or her. And you might be going, well, this, this really seems like it's getting confusing. It's, it's really making the problem even worse. But it is essential in this under, to understand in this study that we are seeking diligently to know that who are, um, sorry, to know if those are of the faith, to help people understand if they are of the faith and how they can find such assurance. One of the large factors that aids or lulls people into such a state of lack of assurance is the preaching they sit under, the churches they attend, or even the teachings they subject themselves to, or the teachers, we could say, that they subject themselves to. And the next two things that I mentioned about this assurance is very important to understand. Often the kinds of preaching and teaching that breeds a lack of assurance is teaching that depicts Christ as suffering on the cross and persuading an otherwise wrathful father almost in a tactic of manipulation of his love and so to forgive others. Secondly, Although depicting Jesus in his love for humanity, and that's warm and reassuring, and it's true, it plants seeds of distrust in the human heart, and it waters a growing element of distrust towards their Father, which cuts off assurance. The basis for this unfortunate and most unsettling development stems from the incongruous teaching of how faith is imparted to the believer. True, we love him because he first loved us. But that only speaks to the human element, the how we feel about what he's done for us, how we feel about such a wondrous love that he has for us. But we should not let that confuse the issue and misunderstand about how faith comes to us. And that's by the grace of God. Same way salvation comes. The feeling of joy of God's love is often short-lived because the heart of the believer lives in the courtroom of heaven and finds itself under constant accusation, doesn't it? Because we know that we're sinful. And the accuser comes when the believer feels the joy of God and accuses him or her of many of the shortcomings that we would find in Christ, dismantling the arguments and the declarations of the believer's heart, decimating the joy, disarming the assurance of the believer. This is what the accuser does. And twice, Paul begins to try and help the believer understand his or her sonship to the Father. In Romans, one time he says something that we'll talk about in a second. And in Galatians, he also says the same thing, or appears to be the same thing, but it's in a, different, a little bit of a different way. In Romans 8.15, he says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to death, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. It is in this case, from the human perspective, the heart of the true believer, listen, 
cries out to the Father, Abba, Father. That is the, the general instinct of a child to their parent. And the law appears to be an enemy of the child, accusing the child of the, the wrongdoing. And then the accuser comes and piles on. And the, the accusations often stifle even the testimony of the believer's heart. But Father, I am a believer. And God says, only in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall a thing be confirmed. And it's at this point Paul reminds us in Galatians 4.16, because you are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the Spirit cries out, Abba, Father, to testify on your behalf. It is the second witness that confirms the witness of the believer, thus reassuring our hearts that we are legitimate, truly children of God, who is our Father. This witness cry of our hearts helps us understand and testify to our position with God, with the Father. The unbeliever has a similar testimony. And instinctively, they cry out, Oh God! in the heart-wrenching situation, rather than the instinctive cry of the child to their father. And sadly, it's an instinctive cry of hopelessness of a parentless child. And Paul is trying to help those who are struggling in their faith, looking for assurance, who are believers, to understand the truth of the gospel, and the law. And I think also it helps those who haven't come all the way. To put their faith in Christ. So he encourages them to drop the fleshly games of self-assurance and to grow and strengthen in Christ. And it reminds them of three things that we're going to see right there in the text. And I've called these the human faith, the heavenly faith. And I have a kind of a weird one, hoaxed faith, which I talked about earlier, maybe doing a half-witted faith, but we'll get to that. Lest there be anyone who truly doesn't understand or truly needs saving. First of all, the human faith. This is the faith of self-effort. Verse 11, or verse 10. Where did I go? I messed up. Nope. Using a different Bible. For as many as the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So what do we mean when I say faith of self-effort? This is those who strive to establish peace with God by means of a good life lived. Right? Lifestyle of good moral behavior. They will find themselves cursed. This is what the text is saying. Everyone is celebrating the Ten Commandments being put into some of the schools in America, and, and that's we, we generally agree that's a good thing. But there's also a danger in that. Because you have a sense of morality being put up on the wall without the gospel being preached. And essentially what you're going to have is a bunch of Galatians running around thinking that they're being saved by their good works. And we got to wonder what teacher will be teaching their perspectives. Mormons, Jews, or not the Jewish, I meant the, or the, uh, even the Jehovah's Witnesses, Satan worshipers. And Satanists are already crying for religious freedom. We just opened the door for them. They're, being, they're already talking about using this for their own religious freedom to get their stuff into a school. Now, I'm not going to say that every one of us should vote against something like that. If it were to come to our state, I don't really know where we would stand on I think we could vote for it and rather have it there than rather not have it there, I suppose. But I'd rather have someone who could teach them the truth. 
maybe it'll drive some to come back to church. We can only pray that would be the case. So I'm not trying to rally everyone for some legalistic approach on this deal, but I'm just trying to highlight there can be a problem when the moral code is what's fixated on. So verse 10 highlights the issue. For as many are as, of, as are of the works of the law, they are under a curse. Because it's written, curse is everyone who does not abide. That's the operative phrase there, abide. Ameno, to stay in the same place, to persevere, to continue, to remain, to persevere in, in such a thing. And this is from the negative sense, obviously, as seen in the, as the inability to remain. The inability to continually, perfectly persevere in the law. And that's what's in view. Cursed is everyone who does not abide. That's a condemning statement. There's no wiggle room there. You must abide. That's an imperative statement. That's a command. If you're going to live by these things, you have to keep all of them. And that means every moment of waking moment of your entire life till you pass through must be kept in perfect harmony with the law. It's not a always, well, except on holidays and every second Tuesday of the third month of the year. This is impossible. We can't do that. But it was never meant to be possible. Paul is not declaring what is possible nor impossible. He's doing what Calvin says. He's drawing on the contradictory nature of the two schemes for the same fountain does not yield both hot and cold. The law holds all living men under its curse and from the law, therefore, it is vain to expect a blessing. Human faith, then, trusts on deeds, knowing that it cannot merit them. And it's foolish. This is what Paul is saying. Especially, think about it, if you know that the law can do nothing for you, but condemn you, as a Christian, it's foolish to follow such a law. The Christian professor that, that walks around trying to keep all such laws, talking about uh, you know, observing holidays and feast days and, and Sabbaths and all these other things, those are not for us. The knowledge has to now take its rightful place. Moving the believer to the only avenue possible. This is dumping all effort, all self-effort at helping yourself. Turning to the only source of true help, which is the heavenly source. That's in verse 11. The heavenly faith is based on what we're going to read here in verse 11. Now, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, the righteous man shall live by faith. And since it's been established, Paul is saying, it's foolishness to the bewitched Galatian, it's foolish to the Christian since no one is justified by the law before God, it is evident or obvious, he is saying, for the conjunctive word right there, we could use to say, because the righteous man lives by faith. Remember what faith is. It's imparted to us by God. Notice he's not condemning works altogether. Paul knows, as James knows, that a Christian will have works. He's merely saying it is not the law that is the justifier, but faith. And this may raise questions regarding the purpose of the law, and we're going to deal with that in the coming verses. But we shouldn't let the fact about the law discourage us or become frustrated that we go, well, God just set the, set the bar too high for us. Uh, we, this, is not, this is not right. This is where Martin Luther came to before he came to faith. He says he hated God, even though he was a priest. 
He hated God. Why? Because he realized that it's just not obtainable. And we'll talk about Nicodemus. He realized it too. Who can do this? Even the disciples at one point realized, Lord, then who can be saved? So we know that the problem is insurmountable. And we know that God is angry with sinners every day. Psalm 711. But not to the point of neglecting his benevolent love and not to the point of neglecting his redeeming love. John 3.16, God so loved the world, right? That he gave, he gave his only begotten son. This establishes the fact that he endeavors on our behalf. He sent the son. In verse 17 in John 3, it said God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Saved from what, we would ask? Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. We are saved from the wrath of God for our unbelief about the Son. Sinners rejecting the only Son that God sent to be the only acceptable substitute. If you know that the law can't do anything but condemn you, you only have one option. That makes Christianity exclusive because you only have one option, which is the only name that men can be saved by, which is Jesus Christ. And if you eliminate that option, now you have nothing. Reject the gospel, and there's no path to peace with God. And John, the writer of John, in verse 36 in chapter 3, says, he summarized it in um, verse 35. I'll give you a context. The Father loves the Son and has given him all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It's a very serious matter to reject the Son. One cannot claim to believe and have faith in God and yet reject the Son and reject the obedience to the gospel command that Christ calls out, apart from faith. Because John says in verse 34, immediately prior to this section, for he whom sent, who God has sent, that's Jesus, utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. If you don't believe the words of Christ... then you don't even have God. One cannot have faith, heavenly faith, given by God without the belief and trust in everything that the Son says regarding God. A faith apart from this heavenly faith is a mere human faith. On a human level saying, yes, I believe there is a God. And that is the, the typical response that people will give you. Ask them about God, they'll say, yes, I believe in God. Or even if you say, yes, I, do you believe in Jesus? They'll say, yes, I, I believe in God. Because God is okay to believe in, but Jesus, that really narrows it down. God is like, to, to most people, um, some superficial entity among men. But one cannot have heavenly faith given by God without believing in everything that Jesus says. There's one more element, and we've kind of run through these pretty fast, but so we see the human based faith, and the heavenly based faith. And now there's this other element, this kind of a hoax. And I'm saying this is like a hoax, as a you're fooling yourself. This is the person who is, Paul is circling back, I think, because this is the person who's secretly holding out hope. Well, the gospel sounds like a good deal and a good offer, but just not ready to commit. Just not ready to bow the knee. Just not ready to bow the knee in submission to God. So there's some small element that still 
has reserved hope for a good life lived where we'll win out. And Paul says in verse 12, However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. And that's what we were saying before. The premise here is to set the bar at its full height. You can't go any higher than this. This is not a high jump situation where we think, you know, maybe the best of the best can get over this deal. This is a, the, the, the bar is so high, it's at the, the top of a second story roof. No human can jump that high. No human can do, perform any self-effort at getting over this. This is what this is directed at. I'm going to go to Leviticus 18 real quick, and this is not really planned, but Leviticus 18 illustrates this point. And the Lord spoke to Moses, this is verse 1, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor what you did, are you to do what they have done in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes. To live in accord with them, I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man will, may live if he does them. I am the Lord. That is the law. It's impossible. You cannot keep all of them. The bar is so high. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. Someone who perhaps rightly believed yet foolishly feels the law following, grows them and secures them, sees this as something they can obtain. And you go, how, how, how can anyone feel that way? It's amazing, but we do. <laughs> or this may identify someone in the profession and yet thinks they, their works either saves them or sanctifies and grows them. But Paul is saying the law is not of faith. He who practices them shall live by them. Like I said, the bar is set super high. And we don't know why, but someone hears this and says, well, I think that we can do our best. I mean, no one's perfect, and God knows that. God knows that we're not perfect, so he'll forgive us because of Jesus. Which communicates that they think they do their part, and Jesus will pick up the slack for where they're not able. That's works-based. hate to tell you that. Someone that thinks that just confessed to be doing works for their salvation. Ezekiel 20, verse 11, might help, kind of narrows it down a little bit further, by which if a, man per, a person does them, he shall live. That's perfection. And re, the reward is eternity. Yet for some reason, the rich young ruler thought, I got this. Go to Matthew 19, and we'll look at that real quick. Verse 16. And then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. What did Jesus just do right there? He set the bar as high as he could, right? 
How does the conversation continue? Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus plays along. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, If you need to be, if you wish to be complete, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What should his question have been when he says, go back to verse 17 if you're reading. And Jesus says, why are you asking me about what is good? Here's a shocking statement. There is only one who is good. What should, what should his question have been rather than which ones? Which commandments do I keep? His question should have been, wait, what do you mean there's only one who is good? Am I that one out of everyone in the, in the country and everyone over all time? I'm the one? Am I? Is that me? What do you mean? Who's the one? I asked about what good deed I can do, and you're saying it won't be accepted? Who is this one? What are you talking about? But he didn't ask any of those questions. He just said, okay, good. Which, which one do I need to do? And I'll do it, man. I'll get it done. Immediately, Jesus raises the challenge of Leviticus 18. He's quoting it. There is only one who is good. But if you, but if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. That's Leviticus 18.5. He just quoted that to him. He raised the bar as high as it could go. And rather than ask, he just figures out, well, which one do I need to do? It's the same thing that Paul does here in Galatians 3. It's the same thing that Ezekiel did in Ezekiel 20. They all raise the bar. If you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. He should have clued in. Paul got it. And I'm telling you now this so that you can get it. And you can help others to see it. The rich young ruler should have got it. And Paul spells it out in Romans 7, 10. The, command, the very commandment that promised life. He's talking about Leviticus 18. Keep it and you shall live. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. John 3, one of my favorite discussions in all of Scripture, Nicodemus. Nicodemus got it. When Jesus raised the bar as high as it could go, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're what? Born again? And he used the Greek word, anathen, which means from above, born from above. Nicodemus got it instantly. How can these things be? Because then in John 3, 5, two verses later, Jesus goes back to Ezekiel and, and says about being washed and cleansed by God. And five times God says in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, I will sprinkle water on you. I will make you clean. I will remove your heart of stone. I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit in you. This is regeneration. This is language of being born again. And he's going to Nicodemus. He's not talking about baptism as I heard someone talking about this morning. Nicodemus wouldn't even have a clue what that was. It didn't even exist. Not, not, not on a Christian level. So Nicodemus says, how can these things be? He, he gets the point that the rich young ruler should have got. And anyone hearing the gospel message going, wait a minute, you're telling me that I can't perform these laws? I can't do these things? How can these things be? 
So our point is to say, don't be so foolish as to wave the gospel off in favor of a life lived with good moral behavior. Don't wave off the gospel of Christ because of the difficulty. He says, come, now my burden is light. And Jesus is the one who is good. Jesus is the one who can keep the law. Look at verse 13. Thirteen. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. When all is lost, we've got nowhere to turn. We know that we can't do it. There's nothing we can do on our own. Christ did for us what we can't do. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Now, don't get this mixed up. I mean, there's preachers out there, one of them named Tom Todd White, who talks about Jesus became an adulterer on the cross. Jesus became, and he this is his language, not mine, he became a sexual predator on the cross. These things are, this is ridiculousness. Jesus took the penalty of our sin. This is substitutionary atonement. This is what we're talking about. Jesus took on us in his innocence. There needed to be someone to take the punishment because what's the punishment for sin? Death. And to pay that in all eternity means you don't go to heaven. But there is one who's eternal that could keep the law perfectly his whole life, which is why he had to come to earth. Jesus just couldn't magically float down out of heaven, out of a star in the sky, and we all look up and go, wow, what's that? And he goes, I pronounce you forgiven. Could do that, right? He's got the power to do that. Except it goes against his character. And he's got to have a human to take our place. And so somebody had to take our place. And it was the Holy Trinity. And the Father, the first person of the Trinity, asked the Son to do this. And the Son was willing to do this because the Father, he loves the Father. And he wanted to, to redeem the people that the Father was giving to him. So he came down, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus didn't do anything to, to get on that tree of his own. All he did was come preach the glorious words of God to the world. And what does the world say? The world that often says, if, if God would just show up and do X, Y, Z, I would what? Believe, right? So Jesus shows up, does X, Y, Z, and a whole bunch more, and preaching, and everyone, John 6 says, they all walked away because they realized this deal wasn't going as far as they thought it was going to go. He wasn't giving them the things that they thought they were getting, and so they killed him. Verse 14 says, in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Adam, might, or Abraham, might come through, or come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of God given through faith, the gift of God. The rich young ruler walked away. Many people, even today, walk away still. Even some who maybe once have professed faith. But you got to understand, this is on a human level. This is the human faith we were talking about. John 6 revealed that. Turn to John 6. I always reference it. Just real quick, we're almost done. So we're going to be really early. Don't get used to it. <laughs> John 6. John 6. Remember, this is the, the chapter starts off with the feeding of the 5,000. We're not going to go through all that. Therefore, verse 14, when people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, truly this is the prophet who has come into the world. They get it. Man from God. Same thing that Nicodemus said. 
Teacher, we know that you come from God, right? Jesus, John 3. So now verse 15, they, they, Jesus perceiving that they're going to take him by force, he withdrew again. Now he goes and tells the disciples, we're not reading anymore, we're just, I'm going to fill in the blanks a little bit. He tells his disciples to start across the sea. They've already been fed. Remember we said the crowd was 5,000 people. That's recorded men. There's probably women, children, likely. Estimates could be 10,000, 15,000. Some people said 25,000. That might be a little high, I think, but it's my personal opinion. But it doesn't really say here in the text. But it says 5,000. Bare minimum, there's 5,000 people got fed. Next morning, they see Jesus is gone. They know he didn't leave in the boat. They don't really know how he got there, but they know he's not there anymore. But he, they know where the disciples are going. Guess who shows up on the other side of the lake with the disciples and Jesus? It's the people. Verse 24, So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side, they said, Hey, hey, man, when did you get here? Jesus. Our buddy pal, the guy that made his lunch yesterday. They're looking for breakfast. The verse 34. Jesus, Jesus told them that I'm the bread. And they said, Lord, always give us this bread. And he said, back in 20, right, I kind of skipped, go back to 26. I say to you, you seek me not because of the signs you saw, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. They wanted breakfast. They wanted more miracles. They wanted to keep this thing rolling. Hey, this is the manna coming down from heaven, right? Now, now he's actually here with us. It's not just falling from the sky. We wake up in the morning and it's there. Now he's just walking around with us. This is even better than that. But look at... Was it verse 66? Yeah. Verse 65, And he was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were walking with him no more. Once he started preaching, once he started teaching, they had nothing else for him. They're gone. These are people who were his disciples. It, it describes them in verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples. We're not talking about the 12, obviously. So it encompasses a whole lot more. Many in the crowd were following around, claiming to be his disciples. And now they're not walking with him anymore. They have human level faith. Nicodemus heard the hard things to hear, but he stayed and listened. After about verse 8, you don't hear from Nicodemus anymore in the conversation. And John goes on telling us what Jesus said to him. So you know that he stayed and he listened. And he continued to believe in Jesus' words. It just took a little bit of time. And Jesus' character over the next several chapters in John. And by the end we see Nicodemus coming to faith. So we say, keep coming. Keep listening. Keep learning about Jesus. Till the gift of faith comes to you like Nicodemus. And like the, the woman at the well. Are we broken like her? Do we have things that we fear? Problems in our lives that we need to come to the Messiah for? Or are we like Nicodemus who ha think that we have a way to heaven? But ultimately, our heart is telling us, you think you got this, but you don't. And so Paul often reminds us to examine ourselves. He encourages you. I encourage you. The writer of Hebrews encourages you. Turn to one last time, and then we're done. Hebrews 6. And I'm going to read this, and then we're, we're, we'll, be, we'll close in prayer. Because I think this... It's a beautiful way to end this section because this is Paul, the, or the writer of Hebrews. We, I, I think it's Paul sometimes, but I go back and forth on who the writer might be if I'm taking guesses. But I just love this section. Verse 9. 
this is the section that I always remember and go to. Thinking of people who, who are religious, who have gone to church, have profess faith, but don't yet seem to have the fruits of faithfulness in their life. But they're, they're not denying Christ. They're not denying God. But the writer says this, But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you. Man, that's encouraging. That's not a, you're damned if you don't believe the gospel. Okay, that might be true. But what a way to talk to someone. Beloved, I'm convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. Though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust as to forget your work and the love with which has been shown towards his name and ministering and have still ministered. These are people who, who are doing all these works. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence as so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And that's what we're talking about. We talked last week, and the, th- the name of the sermon was The Blessing of Abraham. If you come all the way, which is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get you to do, if you come all the way, we call these God-fearers, right? They have a God-fearing sensibility about them. And he, the writer of Hebrews is trying to get you to come all the way, like the centurion, or like the, uh, the, the, the guy that Phil, uh, Peter went to see in Acts. I think it was Acts 10. And he saves the family. Because they, they came all the way. They, they professed the faith. Well, anyway, now I'm preaching. I told you I wasn't going to do that. So let's close in prayer.